from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Fred McMurray in The Lady and the Tumblers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Carpenter. Tonight's play tells the colorful story of a tumbler who, in the early 19th century, made his carefree way from tavern to tavern, entertaining the guests, until one night, in a notorious inn, he met a beautiful and mysterious young lady. Playing the role of the happy-go-lucky vagabond, we have one of your all-time favorite stars, Fred McMurray. <laughs> Our story tonight, The Lady and the Tumblers, is a curious but unforgettable one. It comes out of the half-forgotten style of the past, and it's an odd mixture of comedy, romance, and violent action. It's peopled with lovely women in distress and strong, bold men and dark, cunning villains, all set on a happy stage just a level above reality. It's made of the stuff young boys dream of and young girls wish were more than dreams. But if you listen closely you'll soon find that the lady and the tumblers, too, become as real as your next-door neighbor. And now, starring Mr. Fred McMurray, The Lady and the Tumblers. The only family I ever knew was my Uncle Jim Smith who'd taken me up as a baby when I lost my parents. I was now 16, and I think of reasonable value to him. Jim was a professional strongman who took the name of Stone Crusher. It was spring in the year 1838 that we were wandering through Ohio, traveling slowly along the pikes with our cart and mare, and playing the inns and taverns with our tricks and acrobatics and feats of strength. To those who passed us on the road, Jim was just a big, black-haired man and ragged. But to those who watched him in play or fight, he was a torrent of fierce, trained muscles. And a wise man standing by might have caught in his dark, smoky eyes the glimpse of a startling brain. In those days, Jim was about 30 and in his prime. Look at the lightning, Andy. Yeah, it'll kill our mare this keeps up. Well, if it strikes the mare, it'll most likely strike us too. But we'd better get off the pike and undercover. Uh-huh. There's a tavern just ahead. Right, we'll try our luck there, Andy. Get up, Jennifer. Let's go. We can still land dry. The rain's only beginning. That's not much of an inn, if you ask me. Looks more like a rundown farmhouse. An inn that shabby may be good, Andy, or it may be evil. We'll soon see about this one. Uh, I guess this lean toe's all they have for a stable. Mm, this is a wretched place. Uh, it doesn't look too good to me either. But maybe we can play here for bait and bed. Come along. Now, Andy, this is a cheap place, so we'll put on our cheapest act. The one where I sit on a chair and you tuck my legs behind my neck? Remember, you're very awkward about everything. I know, Jim. Just as I thought. Yes, nothing but loafers and road scum. Yeah. But look in the corner there, Jim, with that young man and all the luggage. Yes. Yes, I see her. She's quite a beauty. Huh. Well, what's a girl like that doing here? And with such a sullen-looking fellow? Well, must be waiting for a stage. Come on. And uh, stumble a little when I take my bow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to be entertained by the great... Stone Crusher. Oh. 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 I'm, I'm sorry, Stone Crusher. I caught my toe. Uh, forgive the boy, please. I picked him up in Louisville recently, and he has not yet learned the trade. I'm teaching him one trick, though. All right, lad, sit on this chair. Now I'll just tuck his legs behind his neck. So. Oh, 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 oh. Well, he's got to be stretched a bit, miss, or he'll never be able to do it by himself. Now then, lad, right yourself. Get to your feet. 
I can't, sir. Something's wrong. I seem to be locked. Well, that sometimes happens. Uh, maybe I'll have to cut a tendon. <laughs> Does anyone have a nice, sharp knife? <laughs> no? Then I'll do it this way. My uncle picked me up, swung me into the air in a somersault, and walked away while I took the floor myself with a roll and a bounce, as I'd done a thousand times before. He, meantime, was tumbling about the room, and we finished by dancing on our hands as the audience tossed coin after coin at us. At last, we picked up our money and retired to a corner table where Jim ordered meat and potatoes for us. Oh, it's a rum crowd, Andy, but it'll pay our bed and board. The girl was taken in most of all, Jim, did you notice? Yes. She's a gentlewoman, Andy. She doesn't belong in this place. Well, uh, the night stage will be along soon. They're only waiting like you said, Jim. I overheard, the, I overheard the young man ask the innkeeper for rooms. They've decided to spend the night. Huh? That's odd. One minute they're waiting for a stage, and the next they're staying here. There goes the young man now. Out back with the innkeeper. Well, I say she deserves a pleasanter-looking escort than him. Pretty as she is. She doesn't trust him, Andy. I can tell by the way she watches him. Yeah. She looks frightened. The fellow's deserting her, that's what. He's taking his valise with him. Hey, you see, he's walking out and... And thrown her to the pack. Yes, they're already looking at her and talking about her. Jim, do you really think he has? Yes, but you finish your supper. Go out and unharness the mare. I'll feed her shortly. I will, Jim. I went outside, and as I rounded the corner of the inn and approached the lean-to, I suddenly came upon three men and a lamp. And then, to my horror, I saw the young gentleman lying on the ground among them. He was dead from a cut throat. It was too late for me to fly, so I pretended stupidity. One of the men, an ape-like with bow legs and a flat face, was wiping a sailor's clasp knife on his pants, but he deftly hid it in his coat sleeve. And the men studied me in silence as I approached. Well, pup? Uh, what happened, sir? A eh, young man was absquatulating on his bill. That's what only he tripped and fell. He killed himself on that there side. You see it? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I see it. What a pity. Poor fellow. Nasty accident. All right, boy. You nip in and tell the innkeeper's wife we want her. Tell her and nobody else. That's a smart lad. Yes, sir. I'll tell her. Jim, there's been an accident outside. So? Anybody hurt? The young gentleman. He tripped and fell on a side. It cut his throat. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. Only there's no blood on the side. And an ape-like man is standing over him with a wet clasp knife. I see. We'll have to act fast, Andy. Come with me. We'll talk to the girl. I know I'm bold, miss, but it's out of necessity. Whose necessity, sir? Yours or mine? Yours, miss. Speak, then. The young gentleman who left you. Is he a kinsman? He's neither kinsman nor a friend, and I'm happy to be quit of him. You are very quit of him, miss. He's just been slain in the stable. Oh, no. I'm afraid it's so. Andy here saw him. Oh, then I, too, am dead. Oh, come oh, on. Oh, there's miss. more to this than you know. I'm sure of it. My only hope has been the night stage, but they'll never let me board it now. We'll see about that. My life's not worth an apple seed. Oh, come now. Even Andy here is worth an apple seed. One should never undervalue oneself, miss. They'll kill me. Not while you have friends, they won't. Andy, take your luggage. Quickly now. And out the door, both of you. Where to, Jim? Down the road. But stick to the brush. I'll be along with the cart soon enough. But can I trust you? You have no choice but to trust us. I suppose you're right. I'll go. Oh, here. Here, take my watch with you. But what for? Take it. Hurry now. Thank heaven. The rain's let up. Yeah. It's dark, though. Can you see well enough? I'll manage. But what about you with all that luggage? Oh, you forget I'm strong. Uh, not as strong as Jim, of course. He's about the strongest man in all the world. He is? Of course. My name is Andy. What's yours? Well, it... Sandal. Sandal Carrick. Oh, that's a pretty name. 
Well, thank you. Uh, tell me something. Why did he give me his watch back there? Well, Jim's mighty proud of that watch sandal, and he removes it on only three occasions. In stone crushing, and for time certain feats of strength, and when he fights. Oh, I see. Uh, Jim's about the greatest fighter in all the world. He won't be long. Uh, we can stop here, don't you think? Oh. Whew. Gosh. Girls certainly travel with plenty of luggage. I'm sorry it's so heavy. Oh, I, I don't mind, really. What if he doesn't show up? Don't worry about him. He'll be along in a minute. But will he really put me on the night stage? Look, Sandal, we're showmen, not thieves. You've nothing to worry about. You can trust us. I don't trust any man. Not anymore. There he comes now. You see? Well, his word's true this far. Uh, throw her luggage in back, Andy. Here you are, miss. I'll give you a hand up. Thank you. There. Now just sit tight and we'll go down the pike a bit and wait for the stage. But how will you stop it at night this way? Oh, I'll use a dry cattail and some sperm oil. Ought to make a fine torch. But where in the world... I've got some in the back. You carry it for fire eating. Oh, of course. But did they show much fight, Jim? Yes, the innkeeper and your ape-like man and the whole herd of your friends. Did it go easily? Well, they had a lot to learn about fighting. Uh, they know now, eh? They know now. <laughs> oh, I, I nearly forgot. Here's your watch. Oh, thank you. Get up there, Jennifer. Ah. Soon after, we put Sandal Carrick on the stage, and it drove away with her safe inside. Then we pulled off the road and went to sleep under the cart. Next morning, we woke to a clear, sunny day, and pretty soon Jim had strips of bacon rolled on sassafras twigs before a fire. After breakfast, I had my usual lessons, Latin, arithmetic, penmanship. Jim was a great scholar and a very patient teacher. When we were finished, he settled back on his haunches and looked at me. Well, Andy, I now have a surprise for you. Huh? Really, Jim? What is it? No need to smile. This is an unpleasant surprise. It just means more of last night's trouble. You mean we're not out of that? Go look in the back of the cart. I'll do it, Jim. This is the young gentleman's valise. I remember seeing him leave the room with it. Yes, a little discovery I made while you were still writhing in slumber this morning. But how did it get in our cart? I've been thinking about that. I believe the girl who... Uh, I believe the girl was in peril. And the young man who was supposed to be her protector decided to abandon ship. So he went outside and saw our cart in the lean-to. He stowed his valise in the back and was just ready to drive off when he was overtaken and slain. Then he was going to steal our cart and mare. Well, if you ask me, he got what was coming to him. He wasn't killed for that. Open the valise. Well, nothing much here, Jim. Just clothes. That's what I thought at first. Look in the toes of those boots. Great heavens. It's a... It's a pouch full of gold. Yes, I've counted it. Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars? Now look in the other toe. All right, it's... It's a... A letter of some sort, Jim. Yes, I know. I didn't take time to read it. Now give it to me. Here. Now then, it's addressed to a Mr. Barnum, Four Chimneys, Blue Lion, Ohio. Oh, then that's the name of the young man who got his throat cut. Yes, poor Mr. Barnum. For such delicate handwriting, must be a woman. Ah, oh, yes, it's signed by Miss Sandal Carrick. That's the girl, Jim. She told me her name last night. She did? Well, I asked her to. Well, that's bad manners to ask a lady her name, Andy. But now we know who wrote the letter. It's still bad manners. Yeah. All right. But, but read it, Jim. Well, let me see. Dear Mr. Barnum. Go on. I have reason to believe that you are in this horrible business against me, despite our childhood friendship. I know I cannot buy the others out, but I have a feeling I can buy you out. Uh -oh. You've always liked the color of money. Here is my proposition. Meet me in Cincinnati at the stage office on the 11th. Come with me on the journey home as my protector and then withdraw. For this, I will pay you $500. Oh. Your ancestors were gentlemen, which I assume makes you a gentleman. Signed, Sandal Carrick. Fine protector young Mr. Barnum turned out to be. Yes, Sandal Carrick made a bad choice in him. He was already against her, as she says in the letter. 
But, but why'd he get murdered, Jim? Well, they must have known of the $500. Your ape-like man and his friends wanted it, that's all. They were waiting at the tavern, then. Yeah, it looks that way. Barnum was in with them and had them planted there. He figured they'd kill Sandal Carrick, and he got it instead. And they'd have killed her, too, if we hadn't stolen her away, Jim. I'm sure of it. But why they wanted to do this, we've no way of knowing. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe Sandal will tell us when we return the money. Maybe. But where do we find her? Probably in that town, Blue Lion. No. No, I can see the letter reached Blue Lion by mail stage. But where it was mailed from, I can't tell. What do we do, Jim? Blast if I know. Well, you you could figure that since we did the protecting and not Mr. Barnum, that we've earned the money. And that way we could just forget about Sandal Carrick and keep the $500. We made no such arrangements with a girl, Andy. Yeah. All right, Jim. So we'll just have to find her. We'll head for Blue Lion. Maybe we can get a lead on her there. Now, let's pack up and be on our way. In just a moment, we will continue with Act Two of the Hollywood Radio Theater. An Indiana soldier by the name of Birch Bay, yes, that's his real name, carried a little excess equipment overseas with him to Germany for occupation duty. To be exact, he had four dollars worth of vegetable garden seeds in his duffel bag. You see, Birch had been a star pupil in agricultural extension work and president of his 4-H club for two years. His military police company arrived for duty in the little German village of Hungen. Here, Birch sent out word to the children that he had a job for them. Ninety turned up, and they represented 45 different families. During his off-duty hours, Birch laid out a garden tract on the edge of town in 45 plots, each six by 20 feet. He parceled out the seeds and supervised the planting. An astonishing quantity of vegetables was raised, and something else was raised, too. The morale of all the people in the village who needed not only food for their stomachs, but sustenance for their spirits. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now here's Act Two of The Lady and the Tumblers, starring Fred McMurray as Jim. Just at dusk the following evening, we came to the town of Blue Lion, a pleasant, sleepy hamlet built about the Blue Lion Tavern, which was a large, showy inn and obviously thriving. We turned our mare over to a groom and entered. As the innkeeper came forward to meet us, he noticed our ragged clothes and his eyes grew stony. Jim faced him, his eyes equally stony. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, sir. And my compliments on this elite hostelry. Thank you. But our rates are rather high, my friend. There's a farmer's inn just north of town. There are times, sir, when I enjoy high rates. I'll be happy to meet your prices if you'll tolerate us. If you meet my prices, I'll be happy to tolerate you. Excellent. Here you are, then. Will that cover it? What? A copper penny? Take this back and be off with you. Oh, you're mistaken, sir. Look again. What? Well, now it's a quarter eagle. Ah, you play tricks. <laughs> Only to make friends. Well, well. Well, for such money, you shall have the best here. So come with me. I'll find you a table and you shall eat. This way. But, Jim, a quarter eagle for a night's lodging. Have you lost your mind? Possibly. Time will tell. What do you mean? Well, for a quarter eagle, we want first a friendly host. Then information. Next, good food and a good bed. And finally, the return of our quarter eagle. There have been worse deals. Oh, uh... We're headed for trouble, if you ask me. Man is born to trouble, Andy. Here you are, gentlemen. Sit down. We serve the best food in Ohio here, and from the best plate in Chinaware west of the Allegheny. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. But before we eat, I have a question. Ask it. Well, it strikes me that I have an acquaintance in this town of Green Lion, a Miss Sandal Carrick. She and her mother have quarters with a relative, I believe, a Mr. Farnham, who lives in a house known as the Chimney on South Crown Street. Now, uh, is this Mr. Farnham present among your guests this evening? I'm afraid you're rather badly confused, my friend. 
This fine town is Blue Lion, not green. I've never heard of any Miss Sandal Carrick here. There's no Farnham hereabouts, uh, but there is a Mr. Barnum, and he lives alone. Also, his residence is known as Four Chimneys, not the chimney, and lies first house beyond the creek on Oak Lane, not South Crown Street. Furthermore, he's now deceased, as of two days ago, from an accident down Cincinnati Way. There. Have I made myself clear? Intolerably, sir. And I thank you. We'll have our supper now. I wish you a good appetite. Thank you. That was very clever, Jim, but it only leads us to the house of a dead man. Sandal Carrick doesn't even live in this town. True, true. Well, then wouldn't it be easier to advertise for her? We'd find her that way eventually. Don't forget she's in danger, Andy. Immediate danger. I never saw you so determined to help anyone, Jim. Hmm. Andy, your father died of a broken heart, as they say, soon after your mother's death. I've never told you this. No? No, you haven't. But why are you telling me now? Your mother died through my carelessness. What? We were standing in an inn yard down in Savannah, just your mother and I. And she was ridden down by a crazy, fractious horse. I saw the horse rear and shouted a warning. But, Jim, how do you see it that you were careless? You warned her. I should have thrown the horse to the ground. I should have thrown him bodily on his side on the cobblestones. I've never seen such a feat performed. You'd have seen it then, Andy, had I only my wits about me. I knew that horse was a killer when I looked into his glassy eye. And you really blame yourself? I do. But never again will I permit a killer, man or beast, to ride down a helpless woman. Oh, I see. You're thinking of Sandal Carrick. I'm thinking of Sandal Carrick. After our supper, we went out into the night and made our way to Oak Lane, where we found Mr. Barnum's house, dark and shuttered. There Jim left me in the yard while he chose a likely window on the second story and climbed up to it. A moment later, he pried it open and was inside. I could see a match flare as he lighted a taper and began to search the room. And then suddenly, my throat went stiff. Another light appeared in a room just below, Two lights, one upstairs and one down. I started across the yard to warn him somehow, then his light went black, and I realized he must be going downstairs. I ran around to the front door, found it off bolt, and entered. Down the hallway ahead of me, I saw a candle light from an open door, and I crept up to it. Inside... Jim was leaning against the wall by a huge mirror, and across the room from him, holding a rather long, flat, rosewood box, was Sandal Carrick. And what is that you're carrying under your arm, Miss Carrick? Never mind. I hardly expected to meet you here. I've been searching for you. I have $500 that rightfully belongs to you. You what? Money I recovered from the effects of the late Mr. Barnum. Oh, and what became of the boy who was with you? Which boy? Boys to me are like thistles, without number or value. I pick them up and discard them thrice weekly. <laughs> then may I ask what brings you here? The money and the fact that you led me to believe you were in peril. I've been searching you out to help you. Ha! Huh. I have no other aim or desire. Ha! Huh. I'm telling you the truth. It appears to me, sir, that you've accidentally stumbled upon something which you believe can be turned to profit and that you've come to this house in an attempt to gain further information to that end. I see. I think it's your hope to replace Mr. Barnum himself in the jeopardy which has been laid against me. Therefore, I consider you a menace. Oh, I am a menace. I no longer trust anybody at all. I'm a different person of late, and I've decided to handle this business, and, and you too, by myself, firmly and squarely as it should be handled. Excellent. I quite approve. You ask about this box I brought with me. Well, it's for emergencies like this. I will meet your price. I doubt if you can. We shall see. Uh, uh, stay where you are while I open it. Sandal laid the rosewood box on a nearby table. Then she carefully opened it and drew forth an enormous horseman's pistol. She swung it around with both hands as though it were a cannon on wheels, pointed it at Jim, and pulled the trigger. Well, you missed, Miss Carrick. You shouldn't fire a pistol at anyone unless you can hit him. I, I have a second chance. Perhaps you didn't know that these things come in pairs. Oh, yes, like doves. Now then. 
Jim was across the floor with a tumble and a leap, and she was in his arms. Gently, his powerful right hand clamped about her wrists and forced the pistol muzzle above her head. Then he slowly pulled the trigger. There. Now you may replace the pistols in the box. Oh, you... you brute! You must forgive my roughness, Miss Carey. But after all, you were trying to kill me. I would have, too. Hello. Andy! Good evening, Sandal. But he said he'd thrown you away or something. Jim likes to be diabolical. Oh, you're rather well-educated for a tavern player. Jim educates me every day. Oh? To think I almost killed him... Jim's about the hardest man to kill in all the world. You confuse me, both of you. I'll be going now. Where? Uh, where do you live, Sandal? Uh, Tell me, Miss Carrick, now how are you fixed for transportation? I have a riding horse hidden in a thicket by the creek. Splendid. Goodbye. Oh, here. Don't forget your pistol box. Thank you. And here in this pouch is your $500. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Sandal Carrick was about the most suspicious woman I'd ever met. But perhaps she had good cause to be. Jim and I said no more about her until noon next day, when we were far to the north of Blue Lion. We'd traveled along the pike all morning and had pulled off onto the turf to rest the mare and to eat our lunch. After we'd finished, Jim pulled a paper-wrapped bundle from his coat pocket. Here, Andy. Catch. I found that last night in Mr. Barnum's bedroom. What is it? Open it. Why, they're mittens. And of the most beautiful fur. Northern lynx, in fact. So? That's what it says in this letter. It was attached to the bundle. Read it, Jim. Well, it's addressed to Mr. Barnum from somebody called J.C. Ives, and it says, Here's something to make old Jason Peregrine really drool. Northern lynx mittens. Post them to him from Cincinnati as you did the beaver lap robe. Enclosed is a letter I have written for you to send along with them. Yours, C.J. Ives. Well, what's it all about, Jim? Well, the enclosed letter to Jason Peregrine explains a lot. What's it say? Well, let me see. It says, uh, sir, it gives me great pleasure to inform you that the Peregrine Ives Fur Company has just established a new and thriving string of posts in the Popo Edgy River Country. And it gives me further pleasure to send along this pair of northern lynx mittens fashioned especially for you by one of our trappers deep in the Teton Mountain Range. Respectful, uh, respectfully, our Dediman manager, St. Louis Branch, Peregrine Ives Fur Company. Well, that, that doesn't explain much to me, Jim. Uh, you haven't lived in the world long enough, Andy. It's clear to me that Jason Peregrine and C.J. Ives own the Peregrine Ives Fur Company. Well, I understood that much. But it's also clear to me that Peregrine's partner, Ives, is swindling him. There's really no fur company at all. The manager in St. Louis is non-existent, and he's kept Peregrine coming on by having presents like those mittens and the lap robe sent to him. It's all a hoax to get Jason Peregrine's money. Where does this Peregrine live, Jim? Well, according to the address, it's uh, Matlitzville, Ohio. Matlitzville? Yes, it's about ten miles up the pike. We'll be there tonight. Well, good, let's get started. Uh, what'll I do with these mittens? I'll wrap them up. We'll take them along. Mr. Barnum evidently fa uh, failed to mail them. Maybe his conscience began to bother him. You're learning, Andy. And, and maybe uh, that's why he got killed. Yeah, you're growing up by the minute, my boy. You think we'll find Sandal Carrick in Matlitzville, Jim? It wouldn't surprise me a bit. That is, if she's still alive. Oh, Jim, they, they wouldn't dare. They've killed one person already, Andy. Come on, let's be on our way. <laughs> Act three of the Hollywood Radio Theater will continue in just a few moments. Corporal Sam Adler of the 2nd Armored Division had an idea that he could put his talent to work for the betterment of German-American relations. His background included two college degrees in music, and he knew that there were many musicians in the Army. So he organized the 7th Army Symphony Orchestra. It was a spare time project that soon gained official notice and the group made a total of 44 appearances in 43 days. New and difficult scores were learned almost overnight, and German and American music was played at each concert. Everywhere the orchestra traveled, the audiences greeted it with amazement and wild applause. 
Here was a group, a cross-section of America, representing all races and creeds that brought together thousands of people on a common cultural and spiritual plane. There's no doubt that through the medium of music, Corporal Sam Adler made a substantial contribution to the improvement of German-American relations. Such acts as these by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of The Lady and the Tumblers, starring Fred McMurray as Jim. Twilight had come when Jim and I creaked into Matlitzville. It was a fair sized town with two inns facing the main square. One was a huge frame monstrosity bearing the sign Cumberland House. And the other was a squalid shack whose sign said simply, Beds and Food, Sam Mahaffey, Proprietor. Jim drove past the Cumberland House and into the tumble-down stable of Sam Mahaffey's ruined inn. There he tied the mare, and we walked back to the front door and entered. A short, jovial man with mutton-chop whiskers greeted us. Strangers, guests, friends, customers, welcome to Sam Mahaffey's Humble Inn. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You don't look rich, neither you nor the lad, but that's all right. My inn is plain, so it won't cost you much. I'm not a journeyman grubbing for his sustenance, sir. I am Stone Crusher, the strongest man in the world. Then you are all the more welcome. I like the look in your eye the moment I saw you. Tomorrow in the square outside, I intend to give an exhibition, pitting my strength against a mammoth rock. I carry playbills announcing this performance. Would you be good enough to tell me which places uh, it's prohibited to tax such bills? <laughs> Certainly I will. Your bills are not allowed on the elm before the courthouse, nor on any shop door, nor on the pillars of the Cumberland House. Then I'll tack them in those places only, <laughs> for the sake of causing anger and rumor and excitement, you understand? You're a fine fellow, Stone Crusher, and I'm proud to have you with us. I have a little daughter who'll enjoy the show with me tomorrow. Good, Sam. And now one other matter. A uh, cabinet maker I know did some work here once for a very charming lady, a Miss Sandal Ives. You're twisted. It's Miss Sandal Carrick. Oh. She lives with her grandfather, Jason Peregrine, across the square, fourth house down from the Cumberland. I, uh, I had it wrong. You did indeed. C.J. Ives is an entirely different party. His office is straight across the square next to the inn. I don't love him at all. He's rich, though. Owns the Cumberland house. Hmm. Uh, with your permission, Sam, I think we'll pay C.A. Ives, uh, Ives a visit before supper. You're your own man, Stone Crusher. Do as you like. Supper's in an hour. We'll be here. Come along, Andy. Did you hear what he said, Jim? It's Sandal's grandfather. Jason Peregrine, yes. Well, no wonder she's mixed up in this. But uh, what are you going to say to C.J. Ives? Oh, anything that comes to mind, Andy. Anything that will upset him for the moment and make him at least hesitate about doing Sandal Carrick in. Yeah. There he is, in his office. See him? Yes. Looks like a possum, doesn't he? Except a possum's harmless. Let's go in, Andy. Who are you? Let's go closer, Andy. Out! Get out! Do you hear me? We are destitute, sir. We've just finished a hard journey. Take off your hat! Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Now, what's this about a hard journey? Fifteen hundred miles. All the way in from the Popo Agee country, sir. That's Trans-Mississippi, you know. I'm a trapper stranded here in Matlitzville. A trapper, you say? From the Popo Agee country? No, no, from the Teton Range. I'm very familiar with the Povo Agi country, however. You are, eh? Uh, how goes the fur business there? There is no fur business along the Povo Agi now. It's moved back. Oh, you must be mistaken. I have a string of posts along the Povo Agi. I've seen no fur posts along the Povo Agi. Perhaps you mean along the snake. I mean along the Povo Agi. Then, sir, I think you are being swindled. Hmm. 
If you are financing fur posts along the Popo Agi, you certainly are being swindled. Mm. Swindled? Stop saying that word. I'm sorry, sir. What are you doing here anyway? Who ever heard of a trapper being stranded? Oh, no, sir. Not trapper. Trooper. What? I'm a showman. Oh. Then what were you doing in the Teton Mountains, performing for grizzlies? I was visiting my brother. Uh, he's a trapper, not a trooper. What? Perform for grizzlies, you say? No, no, no. I, I'm too shrewd for that. Well, there. Two dollars. Now, get out of here. Well, the gentleman wants an exhibition, Andy. What would you like, sir? A little tumbling, perhaps? Or fire eating? No exhibition. I want you to get out of town. Out of town by daybreak, or you'll regret it. Do you hear? That money's foul, Andy. Leave it. Get out! You are unwell, sir. Mm. Come along, Andy. Well, Andy, did you enjoy yourself? I did not. That C.J. Ives gave me a chill, Jim. And quite rightly. He's obviously the person who ordered the murder of Mr. Barnum. And who's after Sandal Carrick? Well, we've got him on the run, Andy. We've got him topsy-turvy. I think what you mean, Jim, is that he's going to have to get rid of us next. Isn't that it? <laughs> You're smarter every day, Andy. Every single day. But wait. This, I believe, is the house, according to Sam Mahaffey. Yeah. I wonder if she's home. Yeah, we'll soon see. Miss Carrick, I think I've got this business figured out. May we come inside? Come in. Uh, come in. I, won't you sit down? Thank you. Hello, Sandal. Hello, Andy. Well? Miss Carrick, where is your grandfather, Jason Peregrine? He's a very old man and he retires early. Oh. Is he a very wealthy man? He owns about half the town. He doesn't own Cumberland House. Well, he did once, but that and a few other properties seem somehow to have gotten into the hands of a certain C.J. Ives. Yes. I, you shouldn't be trying to help me. Well, perhaps not, but uh, I've started and I don't seem to be able to stop. I think I'm beginning to trust you. I don't quite know why. Well, it's easier than trying to pistol me. Oh. <laughs> Tell me, uh, do you know that this Ives is swindling your grandfather? That the Peregrine Ives Fur Company is a myth? I've long suspected it. But I have no proof. And I can't tell my grandfather. He's old and proud, and it's his money. Let him spend it as he wishes. Why did you make that trip to Cincinnati with Barnum? I went to Cincinnati alone. A man named Detterman wrote me from there, warning me to leave my grandfather's affairs alone. Detterman is non-existent. So I discovered. Then I bribed Mr. Barnum to come back with me for protection. And why did you stop at that miserable inn? Well, that was Mr. Barnum's idea. To throw off pursuers, if any. He brought you there to have you slain. I suspected as much when I saw Mansur there. And who is Mansur? Mr. Ives' bodyguard. You and Andy mentioned him, an ape-like man. Oh, that one. He's the one who killed Mr. Barnum. Yes, for the $500. And then he would have done... Uh, then he would have been after you. <clears throat> yes, I know. I owe you my life. You trust me now, Sandal? Yes, Jim. I trust you. Well, this business is far from finished. But we'll see it through. Oh, you must be careful. There are times when it doesn't pay to be careful. Good night. Oh, please. Come, Andy. Uh, in a minute, Jim. Sandal. What is it, Andy? I want to tell you something. About Jim? No, about me this time. Well, of course, Andy. I want to tell you that my mother is dead. Oh? Have you ever been an aunt? No. Well, Jim's my uncle. <laughs> of all the feats Jim performed, stone crushing frightened me most. First, we went into the country and selected a thick slab of stone, weighing goodness knows how much. Then we brought it back to the square where half the town had gathered. I didn't see Ives there, but Stan Sandal stood at the front holding a little pink parasol and looking quite gay. I was sure she'd never seen stone crushing before, or she'd have been as worried as I was. 
Sam Mahaffey came up with his little daughter and stood by me as Jim stripped to the waist and faced the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness a marvelous exhibition of strength. Muscle and bone against cold iron and rock. There on the grass lies a monster stone that I will have placed on my chest where a volunteer will smash it with this sledgehammer. On my honor, there is no fakery to this. It is a matter of brute strength alone. Now, I need two husky men to place the rock on my chest. You, sir, and uh, you, if you will, step forward. Sam Mahaffey, I suspect you've been acting as our advance agent. This is quite a crowd. I liked you both first time I laid eyes on you. And I'll also need a volunteer to break the stone with this sledge. Who among you would enjoy this memorable pleasure? This is the danger, Sam. How, son? Well, you see, if the volunteer can't handle a sledge, the hammerhead might slew when it hits the rocks and strike Jim in the skull. That would be sure death. Surely there's a man strong enough among you to wield the sledge. I will. I ain't too strong, but I'll take a try. Oh, no, Sam. It's that ape Manser. He's a murderer. You killed Jim Shore. I know him well. Uh, hold up a minute. I want my woman to see this. Uh, we'll wait, Sam. Pop into the house, daughter, and get Mama. And while you're there, look in the top drawer of my dresser and bring back my thingamabob. Be sure it's loaded. <laughs> then wrap it in a towel and come back. Hurry now. What's on your mind, my happy? Why, nothing at all, Manser. I'm referring to my pipe. There's a craving for a smoke coming over me. You're holding up the show. I'm sorry for that, and I apologize all around. But I mean to get the fullest enjoyment out of this here stone crushing, and I need my thingamabob to do it. My woman will enjoy it, too. I want you to know, Manser, that I'm mighty fond of that strong man. Here they come back already. Now, you see, that didn't take so long. You're a troublemaker, Mahaffey. How do you figure that now? Ah, oh, thank you, daughter. Yes, this is just what I wanted. You and your mother stand right there. Now, we can get along with this, and I thank you kindly for waiting. Uh, by the way, I sure hope Mansur hits her a good square blow. So do I. He will, Jim. Never you fear, he will. All right, men. Let us proceed. Jim laid himself on the turf, and the huge rock was placed on his chest. Then he braced himself on his heels and hands, inflated his chest, and nodded to Manser, who glanced once at Sam Mahaffey and then took up the sledge. He set his feet, took a deep breath, and swung. It was a tremendous pile driver blow, and it was meant to destroy Jim, even though the hammer struck squarely and there was no slew. The rock was shattered, and Mansa stood there, a look of pure evil on his face. The crowd saw that look and jeered until he dropped the hammer and walked away. Then Jim got to his feet and clasped his hands over his head. Thank you, thank you. And now my lad and I will pass among you and take up a collection. If you think this performance was a fake, I big beg you to give us nothing. All right, Andy. Okay, Jim. And thanks to you, Sam Mahaffey. It was a good show all around, I figure. Go get your money now. The crowd gave generously and applauded even as Jim and I left the square and walked into Mahaffey's place. There, Jim bathed and we had lunch but not before he'd taken Sam Mahaffey's hand and silently thanked him. After we'd eaten, we went out into the square again and started for Sandal Carrick's. But then I sighted her standing before a lace and ribbon shop next to the Cumberland House, so we crossed over and joined her there. Did you enjoy the stone-crushing sandal? Oh, no, I did not. I, I was terrified. Oh. If it hadn't been for Sam Mahaffey and his pistol, that was a pistol, wasn't it? I think Manser would surely have killed you. Well, he did his best anyway. But I want to ask you about something else. Yes? Do you have a good lawyer? Well, we have a fine lawyer, but he does what my grandfather tells him to do. Not if it involves a murder. Have him at C.J. Ives' office at 4 o'clock. You do order me about, don't you? Do you object? No. Oddly enough, I don't. 
Keep this for me till then. Oh, your watch. Again. Now, uh, where can I find this Manser? Oh, Jim, no, you can't fight him. I'll just waste time looking for him if you don't tell me. Uh, oh, all right. He lodges right there at the Cumberland House. Most generally, he's down in the tavern cellar. You go around back, you'll find it. We'll meet at four o'clock at Ives. Yes, yes. Till then. Don't worry, Sandal, we'll be all right. Well, please, please be careful. You go to Mahaffey's, Andy. I'll see you at supper. Not very likely. I'm coming along with you. Well, all right, but stay out of the way. I'll stay out of the way. You can learn by watching. I know. Well, at least there's still time. Time? I mean, he hasn't murdered Sandal yet. Nor will he, by heaven. There's a door. That must be the cellar. We'll try it. It's all stone. The whole cellar. A big place, isn't it? Yeah. There's somebody over there, Jim. And they've got a well down here. Yeah. Set right level where the floor it is. This man's a giant. He is indeed. Excuse me, sir. Where can I find Mr. Manser? Hi, Mr. Manser. You? No, the Manser I have in mind is as stout as you, but shorter. His legs are badly bowed. That's my brother Joe. I'm Tom, the host here. I run this here place. Now, that's fine. Now, where can I find Joe Manser? Joe? <laughs> well, well. How'd you do it, Tom? He done it himself. <laughs> he walked right in as pretty as you please. But he brought his cub. We'll drop him in the well, eh? Where there's room for one, there's room for two. <laughs> I'll use my knife. Stay clear, Andy. We'll take care of you first, strong man! Jim lunged straight forward and loosed a crashing blow to Joe Mance's stomach. The man dropped his knife and sagged to all fours as Jim swung around to meet his brother with a wild blow that landed hard on the temple. The innkeeper was momentarily dazed, and Jim took his time about landing another on the point of the jaw. And he went down hard. Then Joe Manser, who had regained his feet, was on top of Jim before he could turn. They went to the floor, and with a sudden twist, Jim was on his back, his shoulders against the stone and his knees to his stomach. He breathed once, and then shot both feet straight up. Manser caught the blow square in his chest and reeled backward, backward and into the well mouth. Where he disappeared. He, he can't swim. Joe can't swim. Uh, neither can I. But I'll take a look. Well, that's too bad. He must have hit his head on the way down. He's not even splashing. Uh, then he's dead. We can't get a rope down to him now. Well, I'll report the manner of his death to the authorities. But meantime, I want you out of town. Out by daybreak. Do you understand? I'll go. I'll go. Now see that you do or you'll end up like your brother. Huh. Come along, Andy. It must be nearly four o'clock. I want to go to my happies and clean up a bit first. <laughs> I thought I told you to leave town. So you did, Ives. But it's a curious thing. Instead, I just told your innkeeper to leave town. What? Tom Manser? And you're next. Now, look. I don't know just what you're up to, but there are ways of taking care of you. No, not now. Your Joe Manser just tried murdering me. But this time he killed himself, as you might say. Oh, no. Oh, Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, you're all right. I am. And you're safe now, Sandal. What is this? What are you all doing here? Hey, Jim, this is Mr. Silsby, my attorney. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Now, I, too, would like to know why we are here. It uh, has to do with these, Mr. Silsby. Uh, fur mittens? Where did you get those? And uh, these letters. I think they'll explain everything. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, make the old buzzer drool. Post them as you did the lap robe. Well, well. Popeye River country... One of our trappers. 
My, my, Dediman Manager of St. Louis. Say, this is something. It's quite clear, don't you think? Oh, quite clear, quite clear. Then I want all the property, including the Cumberland house that Ives has defrauded Mr. Peregrine of, to be reassigned immediately under your direction. No, wait, please, listen. Ives, from the very beginning, I have never liked you, and this is going to give me great pleasure. In fact, I'll happily assist in your prosecution. Maybe we can prosecute him for murder while we're at it. It was his hireling, Joe Manser, who murdered Mr. Barnum. Andy here is a witness. How do you like that? Oh, I like it very much indeed. (laughs) I certainly do. No, no, you must listen. I know nothing of any murder. I do admit I've somewhat misrepresented things to Mr. Peregrine, but I'm willing to make full restitution. It so happens I'm about to leave town... By daybreak? No, now. By sunset. Take care of the legal matters, will you, Mr. Silsby? At once, I certainly will. Oh, yes. Come then, Sandal. They can work this out alone. Yes, Jim. Jim. Yes, Sandal? It's a beautiful night. That isn't what you meant to say. All right. Do you think you'll miss traveling up and down the country, being a showman? Miss it? Oh. Yes, I'll, I'll miss it. Oh. But I can still do some tumbling and odd tricks right here. Oh. I've already spoken to Sam Mahaffey about it, and as soon as he's installed as host at the Cumberland House, I can show there regularly. You won't mind. I wouldn't miss a performance for all the world. <laughs> Perhaps I can teach you some tricks, too. Me? Uh, good heavens, like what? Well, uh, like fancy shooting. With pistols. Oh, Jim, how horrible. I, I might have killed you then. Uh, but you didn't. A good thing, too. Is it, Jim? Why? Well, because of Andy. Andy? Yes. You know, uh, Andy has no mother. Yes, I do know. Andy told me. Oh. But Andy will be all right now. Of, of course he will, Sandal. And I'll do my best, Jim. For both of you. Well, then we'll both be all right now. In a moment, Fred McMurray will return. Captain John J. Dignan had never seen the French city of Royan except from the air. During World War II, our flying fortresses were forced to destroy it almost entirely. It was during a critical time, the Battle of the Bulge, and Royan was a key point in the German supply line. But after the war, Captain Dignan got a bunch of his friends together to help the people of Royan. Not long afterwards, 600 babies wore clothes collected by his group, as did more than 1,000 school children. These clothes, possibly, are still being worn by other children in Royan. Such acts, by you and your friends today, are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Fred McMurray. Well, an actor's life certainly must be exhausting, Fred, all that tumbling, detective work, romance. Oh, Ken, it is, it is. I'm going right home and lie down. I wish you would. (laughs) I understand, Fred. After your latest picture for Republic, Fair Wind to Java, one of the most exciting action-filled dramas we've seen, you deserve a rest. Oh, thank you, Ken. Now, just relax and listen. I understand it's a, rom- a romantic comedy next week. Yes, and a delightful one, Fred, titled The Fall of Maggie Phillips. And as our star, we'll have one of the finest actresses on screen or stage, Dorothy McGuire. Well, that's for me, Ken. Good night. Good night. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.